Thank you everyone for attending today's session, Law and Disability in Canada. Today's session will run about 45 minutes with time at the end to answer questions. Please post any questions in the chat box. Any unanswered questions will be answered offline after today's session. We have received a tremendous response to this webinar and we are hosting a large audience. If you experience technical difficulties, we suggest you exit the meeting and re-enter it using the links provided in the email. Rest assured that LexisNexis will distribute a recording of today's session in a follow-up email. Now we will meet today's presenters. I am your moderator for today, Monica Sorensen. I am the Print Marketing Manager here at LexisNexis Canada. Ruby Dand is an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Law at Thompson Rivers University. At True Law, Dr. Dan teaches in the areas of human rights law, health law, mental health law and policy in Canada, and community lawyering. David Ireland was called to the Manitoba Bar in 2011. His legal practice in criminal law has included both defense and prosecution work. Professor Ireland has also been involved in public interest legal work concerning inquests, public inquiries, as well as human rights litigation pertaining to disability. Laverne Jacobs is a professor and former associate dean, research and graduate studies at the University of Windsor Faculty of Law. She teaches research and writes in the area of law and disability, administrative law and justice, and human rights. She is Canada's candidate for the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I will now turn it over to Laverne, who will be giving a special introduction. Thank you for the introduction, Monica. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Laverne Jacobs, and I'm the lead author and general editor of Law and Disability in Canada. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar book launch. We're delighted that you're able to attend, and we thank LexisNexis for organizing this event. I join you from the University of Windsor, which sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprising the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. I'm very excited to be here today to introduce our book. Law and Disability in Canada is a set of cases and materials that came together out of three shared aspirations. The first was an interest to incorporate issues facing people with disabilities more fully into the law school curriculum. Several years ago, as a professor with research interests in law and disability studies, I had created a course on the topic in Windsor, sorry, at Windsor Law. In 2017, I reached out to some colleagues who also had expertise in the field, some of whom had created similar courses at other Canadian law schools. I believed that we could collaborate to create a textbook for those teaching courses dedicated to law and disability. This is how our original group of wonderful colleagues was formed. Before our book, there were no Canadian textbooks on law and disability. But we weren't just interested in a book for law and disability courses. We realized quickly that this book could also serve to provide materials to professors teaching in a variety of legal subjects who wanted to bring issues facing people with disabilities into their courses. These subjects include constitutional law, family law, criminal law, and labor and employment law, to name just a few. In this way, the book serves to fill a gap that we all noticed in law schools. And this gap is the absence of discussion about people with disabilities as they encounter the legal system. Our second aspiration dealt with assisting professors and teachers in fields outside of the law. We realized quickly that it can be a challenge to talk about law in related disciplines without some foundational material. We've designed a book that we believe will be helpful to individuals who teach in related fields, such as disability studies, social work and human resources. And we believe that it will be helpful when they need information on the legal aspects of their field. Finally, last but not least, a third aspiration for this book was to provide materials on how people with disabilities encounter the law as they move through the life course. So through the workplace, through community living, to give just two examples. And to do this while recognizing the multifaceted intersectional existence of many members of the disability community. In fact, the life course, intersectionality, and access to justice are three key themes of our book. This book therefore has value for both practitioners and act academics. 
It provides substantive information on law and disability in a variety of legal practice areas. And today's webinar topic is an example. In sum, this book came together from an idea about how to share information about the experiences of people with disabilities as they encounter and are engaged with the law. We've sought to use our expertise and research to support others in teaching and practicing law as it interacts with the lived experience with dis of disability. And we've also sought to assist in eradicating barriers faced by people with disabilities as human beings in color and context. From the time that the book came together as a concept to its final version, everyone in this group, including myself, discovered the need to conduct original research because of the many gaps in knowledge that are out there. All of us care deeply about these issues and about the disability community. It's been a truly amazing and humbling experience to see the enthusiastic interest in this book. I think that this is a moment when research and scholarship on law and disability can genuinely make a difference. I'm so excited that this contribution to the literature has come together and I'm grateful to have had such a fantastic group of colleagues to work on this project with me. I want to take a moment to acknowledge my colleagues who are co-authors on the book, all of whom I believe are here today. And then I will, will turn it over to two of those colleagues, David Ireland and Ruby Dan for their presentations. My co-authors for this book are law professors, Ruby Dand of Thompson Rivers University Faculty of Law, David Ireland of the University of Manitoba Faculty of Law, Law Dean and Professor Richard Jockelson of the University of Manitoba, Professor Freya Kodar from the University of Victoria Faculty of Law, and PhD candidate Odelia Bay from Osgoode Hall Law School. And we're grateful to have had contributions from Braden McDonald, a Master of Law student at the University of Manitoba as well. It's my pleasure to now turn the mic over to my colleagues, David Ireland and Ruby Dand. Through their presentations, David will discuss the challenges faced by people with disabilities within the criminal justice system. And Ruby will speak about access to justice for people with mental health disabilities and addiction, both extremely important topics. So thank you. I'll turn the mic over to you, David. Thanks, Laverne. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, it really is. And I echo everything uh, Laverne just said in terms of uh, how fabulous this has been to work with such a, a wonderful group of co-authors. It really has been a privilege for, for me uh, to do so. So, so thanks again uh, for uh, including me in this project. Uh, uh, along with my uh, co-authors, I, I authored uh, four chapters uh, in the book, and we're going to talk a, a little bit about them, uh, bringing uh, uh, the aspect of criminal justice or lens of criminal justice to, to disability in Long Canada. And um, those co-authors are Richard Jockson, who's my colleague uh, and boss, I guess, now at the University of uh, Manitoba. Uh, and uh, at, time, at the time, his LM student, Brayden McDonald, Brayden's a, a, a wonderful young man. Uh, and is now, I think, finished his LLM. So congratulations, uh, Braden. Uh, and both of them uh, were absolutely incredible uh, in, in helping uh, shape these chapters. When we were first approached uh, to, to be involved with this project, you know, we were struck at how little uh, case law research there really was on criminal justice and criminal law uh, and disability, certainly outside of the sentencing or, or corrections uh, format. And we wanted to do more than that. We wanted to look at um, uh, other aspects of the justice system, uh, police intervention, citizen state interaction, uh, arrest, detention, the trial and sentencing of persons with disability, and really try and explore those uh, through this kind of uh, textbook format. And uh, I think we're able to uh, to do that, uh, but we did notice there weren't a lot of cases. The cases that we we do uh, research and talk about in the chapters uh, really show an unevenness uh, in terms of how disability is dealt with uh, in the courts, and that was uh, that was a big sort of uh, takeaway for uh, for us. But 
In terms of the chapters themselves, you'll, you'll see them listed there. Uh, we first engage with the arrest and detention. So uh, people uh, with disabilities uh, interacting with the police uh, and uh, that whole investigative piece. And there was no doubt uh, from the literature that persons with disabilities are overrepresented in the criminal justice system, despite the fact that there are not a lot of cases uh, about them. Uh, it's certainly not because persons with disabilities aren't engaged in the criminal justice system uh, as accused, they most certainly are. Um, and what we gleaned from, from the cases overall when we looked at arrest detention and trial and sentencing to, to some degree um, was a significant lack of, of empathy uh, when it comes to the treatment of persons with disabilities uh, at the hands of the, uh, the authorities. Um, and addressing that sort of endemic ableism is no different from addressing many of the other prejudices that, that happen in the criminal justice system, tackling racism, misogyny, and, and various other uh, intersecting uh, problems that we have. So that that became apparent when we when we start to do the the research for this many of the cases of the arrest and detention chapter focus on um uh, both physical and mental health disabilities, right? Looking at how uh, actors in the criminal justice system have treated persons with disabilities. On the uh, mental health disability uh, front, many of the cases we, we looked at became a very interesting area for us, uh, are about uh, statements that the accused makes to the authorities. So statements that are made to the police uh, and how uh, that is dealt with uh, in our system. We have a system that has, as we like to say, an obsession with confession, right? So asking uh, people to um, uh, questions about a crime in the hope that they confess to, to doing it as a shortcut to, uh, to convicting them. And we found that the, 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 the case law is not friendly uh, to persons with disabilities, particularly cognitive disabilities, uh, as far as that goes. Uh, we have a, a, a jurisprudential structure around uh, Oikel and, and Whittle, uh, two Supreme Court Canada cases that really uh, box in uh, this sort of uh, area of jurisprudence in terms of asking for statements to be uh, thrown out an operating mind uh, principle. So, so we have sort of an unfriendly case law. And what, what we also notice and what we, we comment on in the chapter is the, the access to justice issue involved in disability in terms of advocating. So we found that, that much of the time in order to, to argue that, you know, a statement should be thrown out or whatever the particular point of um, uh, that is, um, you, would, you would be looking at having to, to call expert evidence and having to, to put, put a great deal of effort uh, into trying to convince a court that you were, you know, when I say this, uh, not to sound glib, but disabled enough uh, in order for a, a positive result to, to come out. Uh, and we're found in, when I talk about themes, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's sort of what we've, we've kind of found. In trial and sentencing, uh, in uh, chapter seven there, we, we see far more cases around mental health disability than physical disability. It's fairly evenly split in the arrest and detention chapter. Uh, we really get into far more of the mental health disability within trial and sentencing. Uh, and again, many of those cases focus on um, fitness to stand trial and not be criminally responsible uh, and the, the treatment of persons with disability sort of within that model. On the physical disability side that we do have within trial and sentencing, we have, we have some interesting cases. We have sort of bright uh, spots, if you like, or bright cases that, that give us like, uh, it's a case called Wa, uh, where a, a person with a, uh, who was deaf and was unable to read and write was given a judicial state of proceedings uh, because they're unable to essentially engage in their defense or engage in, uh, in the trial aspect. Uh, and those are positive. But then we have cases uh, relatively sort of famous lower court decision called Shanahan, where uh, a person in a wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair, a person with a disability, um, is prosecuted for being uh, drunk in charge of, of, of that, uh, uh, what is seen as a conveyance uh, within the law. And lots of equality arguments are, are made in terms of uh, people with uh, those disabilities being held to a higher standard um, than, than other people would be. And that decision is, you know, arguably extremely infantilizing and certainly paternalistic uh, towards people with disabilities. So those cases unfortunately became relatively common as we did the research and begin to, to write up these chapters to see a sort of um, an albeit uneven response but a bit of a theme running through the cases that persons with disabilities are, are not being treated uh, equally.
So there's kind of a constant in these cases um, of a general sort of assertion by the state that disability is, is not important or certainly not a primarily impactful factor in the criminal justice system. It's seen almost in some cases as an annoyance uh, by the criminal justice system that something has to be dealt with. And we'll talk in a, a second about some of the themes that come out of sort of over medicalizing and, and those things that, that are very prevalent within the criminal justice system. Uh, the second two uh, chapters that, that we wrote, uh, chapter eight and chapter nine, uh, specifically deal with inquests under the Fatality Inquiries Act. And I was extremely happy to be able to uh, be part of authoring these chapters. I, I've been fascinated by this process, legislative process, uh, since the Crown Attorney and being uh, inquest counsel on, on some of these matters. Really, really fascinating uh, to, to know. And what it struck me uh, as a practitioner was how often a uh, person with disabilities were engaged in, in state death, like they were in state care when they died or in a direct state confrontation. It was very obvious to me and everybody else that that was happening. So I wanted to explore that and think about that uh, academically, certainly, but also as a practitioner to, to really try and understand a bit more about that dynamic. Uh, and, you know, as, as you, you may or may not know, in, in provinces that vary, but all around the same sort of theme in Manitoba, on the Fatality Inquiries Act, it's an investigation anytime somebody uh, dies who's in state care or direct confrontation with the authorities. Um, and the, the sort of culmination of that is an inquest. A provincial court judge uh, sits uh, as a, a judge in inquest, and it's an investigatory process. It's, it's not adversarial um, to try and understand what happened, the factual basis for what happened, and then, of course, to make recommendations. Uh, out of that. There were 93 such inquests that we looked at, so there was a, a number. Um, and when we went through 93 inquests, we identified 44 of those inquests as having to do with persons with disabilities, so a, a very high number um, were, were directly related to persons with disabilities, either physical or, or mental disabilities. Um, we split those between two chapters because of the, the amount that we had, more, more than uh, anything else. One dealing with the criminal justice system directly. So people who are involved in the criminal justice often in the hands of the police. Um, and there was about 26 of those, I think. And then the, the remaining uh, 18 were uh, in the uh, non or outside the criminal justice system. Most of those cases uh, are involving uh, healthcare, healthcare and community living situations where uh, persons with disabilities have, have died. Uh, so of the criminal justice chapter eight, of the criminal justice ones, um, 11 of those inquests dealt with uh, deaths occurring during initial contact with the authority, seven involving fatal confrontations with the police, so the police shooting people, uh, for the most part, with disabilities. Uh, the other four were attributable essentially to addictions, uh, people that had overdosed and, and things like that. Um, uh, 15 of the inquests dealt with deaths in institutional settings, right? So, and of those 15, uh, and so we're talking about uh, hospital wards if someone's under uh, police custody uh, or the remand center or prison, uh, things like that. Uh, of the 59 uh, tragically involved suicide, so people that had taken their own lives. Um, and then the remaining six were attributable to, to various other causes. But the, the key to remember is that all of these involve uh, an individual who's in state care or direct conflict with the, uh, with the state uh, at the time of their death. And the inquest chapters tell an important, I think a very important and, and really very tragic story of, of the most extreme outcomes of marginalization in Canadian society. Uh, and we see that in, in, in all of the cases, frankly, but there's no greater example than the, the sort of Errol Green inquest. And that's one that we, we talk about at some length in, in the chapter. Um, he was an Indigenous man uh, who died in 2016 of an epi uh, epileptic um, seizure at the Winnipeg Remand Centre. He'd actually come to the Remand Centre uh, twice. He came in March, uh, had two seizures when he was there, uh, wasn't given any uh, medication. He actually had a seizure when he was, uh, sorry, had one seizure the first time when he was discharged. Uh, he came back in April, had two seizures. Um, and died. Uh, Mr. Green was intoxicated both times he, he'd gone into the remand center uh, and he was never given his uh, anticonvulsant medication. Uh, and of course he, uh, he died as a, as a result. Um, the, the judge was able to, to make a number of, I think, very good recommendations, uh, many of which were, were structural. Um, you know, nursing staff couldn't get a hold of, 
um, a doctor on the weekend so they couldn't get sign off on, on giving people medication and, and things like this. Uh, there was another policy, a bizarre policy that existed at the remand centre that, you know, medical intervention, you know, you weren't to call an ambulance unless someone had been convulsing for over five minutes, you know, and stuff like that were, were identified as being like wrong, <laughs> uh, in essence, that, that, that you can't, can't have that. And it was impossible really to read the, the, the Green Inquest without thinking about uh, Brian Sinclair. I mean, we deal with Brian Sinclair's inquest uh, in chapter nine, along with many others, unfortunately, uh, fairly similar, some of them. Um, Brian Sinclair, is, as many of you will know, was uh, a double amputee, an indigenous man is a double amputee who died uh, in um, the Health Sciences Centre. Um, here in, in Winnipeg, and he died after waiting in a waiting room uh, unattended for 34 hours. Uh, he is a very, very, very tragic tale. September 2008 goes into uh, goes into the emergency room uh, because he's having trouble. He's catheterized. He's having trouble with his, uh, his catheter. He goes in and literally uh, dies of neglect uh, because nobody uh, pays him any attention uh, until he dies of sepsis. So he dies of a, the same reason he went in to have fixed, and it could have been fixed. Um, he uh, he's ignored until it actually uh, actually took his life. Um, very very tragic. Again, lots of structural commentary in the inquest that's important when we're thinking of persons with disabilities. Uh, structural commentary around. Um, uh, the size and shape of the waiting room and uh, things that we, we see emphasis often put on, not on disability, uh, but on, you know, what we can do better uh, sort of by, by moving some things around a, a waiting room. Uh, obviously, uh, he was an Indigenous person and, and, and racism uh, and sort of racial stereotyping certainly gets, gets played in the inquest as it should uh, in the inquest as well. And it's not that disability in the inquest is, is ignored, but this is someone with a profound disability, somebody who's a double amputee and somebody who uh, had other cognitive uh, issues as well caused by uh, other things early in, in their life, <clears throat> excuse me. And there really isn't a massive uh, amount of attention paid to that, which is somewhat uh, worrying in the, in the grand scheme of things. So to so identify some of those issues, um, bias and indifference uh, certainly play a big part in a lot of these inquests when it comes to uh, persons with disabilities. But there's, there's other um, uh, problems as well. There, there's no question about that. So I just want to talk sort of um, uh, quickly in the next sort of five minutes, just about some of the themes that we've extracted when we're, we've done this work. And I think are really important for the book in terms of tying in with other content in the book, but also uh, from a learning perspective. You know, the book has a, a really wonderful um, sort of structure where we ask questions, notes and questions after each sort of section. And it, it's really <clears throat> sort of around these themes that in, in our chapters, at least that's kind of how we're structured um, looking at them. Uh, it, it, it's very obvious when you, when you read all of these cases, either the, the interaction cases or, or the inquest cases, uh, there's an overrepresentation of Indigenous uh, persons with disabilities. I mean, there's an overrepresentation. I hate that word. I don't know why I continue to use it. It's like the worst euphemism in the world. But there, there are far too many uh, Indigenous people in the criminal justice system, and many of them. Uh, are persons with disabilities. And that was very, very clear uh, when, we're, when we're doing this work. Um, you know, I think it's worth noting that <clears throat> the Truth and Reconciliation, excuse me, Commission Calls to Action specifically identify uh, healthcare and certainly disability. Uh, there's specific uh, calls to do with FASD and, and things of that nature. Uh, and again, we've had very little movement on those calls. Um, and we can certainly see the need to, to focus uh, on that going forward. We also talk about the intersection of race and disability in general, right? And that's uh, something that other uh, uh, authors have, have touched on. And that's definitely a theme that we've noticed. Uh, new Canadians, um, uh, racialized populations, BIPOC populations being, being directly um, sort of marginalized through, through disability and that intersectional uh, sort of aspect. So all of that is very, very thematic through all this. And we, we ask questions and pose questions about, uh, I think we talk about uh, R, R versus Lee, which, you know, the, the decision uh, a couple of years ago in the Supreme Court of Canada, talking about race in the context of the charter and arrest and detention. And we challenge readers to, to think about disability in that context. Like what, what difference would it make some of the cases that we present if disability was uh, uh, seen as being uh, a more important uh, thing that it is by, by some of the authorities. 
We notice a highly medicalized sort of construction of disability. Um, we don't really define disability in our chapters. We, we take disability as it's defined to us in the cases. Um, but I, that said, it's highly medicalized. Uh, there, there's not a, a particular engagement um, with a uh, critical social model of disability at all. Disability in the criminal justice system, I think it's fair to say, is seen as something that needs to be fixed, right? How do we fix disability? How do we, you know, if someone's unfit to stand trial, how do we make them fit to stand trial? Like, how do we, how do we sort of come at this in a in a, a fixing sort of capacity? And with that, we see a minimization of disability as well throughout all of the cases, really. An idea that disability is not um, really at the forefront of what needs to be decided within criminal justice. So we see that sort of minimization and we see it in, in not criminally responsible. We see it in uh, uh, various other aspects, statements I mentioned before, you know, you're not disabled enough for us to toss your statement, right? So that minimization is key. Acknowledgement without action is, is something that I, I put there to, to really just look at, you know, as you go through the cases, it's so prevalent to, to see the 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 fact that there, there's crown opposition to so much right the, it, it, admissibility or sorry disability is is um acknowledged but, but nothing positive is done right and almost all the crown sentencing appeals we look at in the sentencing section you know you know they're all sentences imposed on disability the crown says were too lenient even though disability was taken as a, a factor in, in mitigation. You know, when we look at, you know, Shannon had mentioned before, you know, Maisie is a case with a blind accused who was, you know, um, accused of a break and enter, applied for state funded counsel because they couldn't see, they, they wanted state funded counsel and the Crown opposed that. Now state funded counsel was awarded in that case, but the Crown opposed that application uh, for someone to, to be uh, put on an even playing field. Um, so those are really important. Uh, Genero is another case uh, where the Crown tried to have admitted uh, into evidence against the accused comments they'd made in their fitness uh, application for trial. So, you know, essentially weaponizing disability uh, for the Crown, which is really, you know, worrisome. And I think probably ties into to some of the stuff that Ruby will talk about as well, that, that people, that, the, the real uphill battle that persons with disabilities are facing in, in terms of being a marginalized population. So, you know, those are those are some of the things that, that I wanted to, to highlight uh, for everyone. Uh, I think I've probably uh, eaten up a, a probably more than my share of the time. So I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna pass it on now to, uh, to Ruby. Thank you so much, David. Uh, that was fantastic. Hi, everybody. I'm so honored to be part of this project. Uh, thank you so much to LexisNexis for organizing this webinar and your support. And thank you to all of you who are attending and engaging in this dialogue. In particular, I'd like to thank uh, our incredible co-authors, uh, the TRU Faculty of Law, uh, SHRC, uh, the Law Foundation of BC, and I'd also like to recognize a number of the research assistants that I was able to work with on this research, and all of my mentors, who a number of whom are here today. I am very excited to be speaking here from Kamloops, BC, which I acknowledge my privilege claims space on the unceded First Nations territory belonging to the to Kamloops to Shikwetmik people. And therefore it is with accountability and humility that I answer the call for truth and reconciliation in my work. Today, I'm gonna to be speaking about a few key themes that emerged uh, from the research in this book regarding the extent to which mental health courts and specialized courts increase access to justice for people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities and intersecting barriers to accessing justice for people with disabilities. I'm gonna be covering three main areas, which include the context in which mental health courts have emerged and the process in which they follow, findings from the empirical research, which was kind of embedded in the research in the chapters, and that I've conducted regarding the types of barriers that people with mental health and addiction issues experience when participating in the mental health court and specialized court process. Um, and I'll also cover some of the kind of law reform and policy recommendations to improve access to justice. And lastly, I will also cover some of the experiences of women and girls with disabilities in terms of gender disability discrimination. 
So I've just prepared a snapshot of the themes within the book. And as David had emphasized, it's really important to highlight the context in which people with mental health and addictions, issues, and disabilities often experience discrimination and the significant barriers to accessing justice they experience in the criminal justice system. When legal proceedings occur, people with mental health and addictions issues often experience discrimination and multiple barriers to accessing justice where charter protected liberty and autonomy interests are at stake. And as a result of deinstitutionalization, a lack of appropriate community-based supports and services and multiple intersecting social factors, people with mental health and addictions issues are disproportionately represented and misunderstood in the criminal justice system. In Canada, we recognize that research suggests the criminal justice system has become the front line in mental health services. And so the chapter really kind of dealt with a number of those themes and also recognized that people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities often experience discrimination. And this is further complicated when issues of race, culture, ethnicity, gender, class, disability, and other social factors are involved. Given their lived experiences of intergenerational trauma, colonialism and social determinants of health, we recognize that indigenous peoples within the criminal justice system experience high rates of suicide, addiction and other disabilities, systemic discrimination and racism. So in terms of this question that the chapter kind of dealt with in terms of what are mental health courts and do they increase access to justice, Canada's mental health courts were created as a multidisciplinary legal approach to address the overrepresentation of people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities in the criminal justice system. They're based on the principles of this idea and the principle of therapeutic jurisprudence, which is an interdisciplinary legal theory drawing from law, psychiatry, psychology, criminology, and social work. Therapeutic jurisprudence suggests that the law, legal processes, and legal professionals have a direct psychological impact, either therapeutic or anti-therapeutic, on participants involved in the legal processes. Applying these principles, mental health courts are problem-solving courts focused primarily on diverting people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities with minor criminal charges from the criminal justice system into more community-based mental health treatment. They offer a collaborative strategy to increase access to services, achieving tangible outcomes, and to decrease recidivism among people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities. So in the chapter, I did recognize that there are a number of different designated mental health courts, some that are also undesignated, but they are across Canada and provinces such as Ontario, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, Manitoba, Newfoundland, and New Brunswick. There are also a number of specialized courts in British Columbia and the territories which have similar goals to mental health courts, but not, are not exclusively for people with mental health and addictions histories and disabilities. So in BC, a number of these courts include the Vancouver Community Court and the Victoria Integrated Court, and I'm also currently working on a project to ensure that there's a Kamloops Community Justice Court here. So the procedures of the mental health courts and specialized courts in Canada often vary and each court is run differently. However, there are a number of common features such as a single docket and a post plea program. Eligibility requirements include people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities who are accused of minor offenses such as theft, fraud, mischief, assault, obstruction, public intoxication, and able to voluntarily consent to participate in the program. The Crown often refers individuals with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities to the courts if a reasonable and relevant connection between the mental health and addiction issue of the accused and, there is, and the alleged criminal offense is established. Participants should agree that they're responsible for the crime, but most courts do not require them to plead guilty. And mental health courts and specialized courts strive to ensure that there is an appropriate access to health care, housing, support and monitoring available through the court and community. Participants are often given an individualized treatment and support plan as an alternative to criminal sanctions. 
And the participant's willingness to join the court process is a mandatory requirement. So in the chapter itself, I drew from empirical research that was used to critique the barriers for people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities experience when participating in the mental health court process. I'd like to recognize when critiquing the barriers, it's important to recognize that many of these decisions from the mental health courts and specialized courts do not have written reasons, so the analysis really had to draw from a qualitative perspective, from interviews to hear the voices and stories of people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities. I had also the opportunity with a number of my research assistants to observe cases and interview multiple participants who went through both the mental health court and specialized court processes. There is little research critically evaluating Canadian mental health courts from the perspective of people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities. And in both Canada and the United States, previous studies have primarily focused on recidivism rates. And since each court operates differently, it is sometimes challenging to kind of analyze and evaluate the success of Canadian mental health courts as each court has different varied goals. So there were approximately 120 interviews with key stakeholders in multiple different provinces, including BC, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, and there was observations of multiple hearings. And I did have the opportunity to interview a wide range of stakeholders, such as people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities, particularly those from Indigenous, racialized and other equity seeking communities, Crown Council, judges, lawyers, healthcare providers, mental health court workers, service providers, disability advocates, academics, police officers, probation officers and forensic mental health and addictions commissioners and correctional officers and criminologists. So just to highlight a couple of the themes that occurred and that are kind of explained in the chapter include the recognition that Indigenous and racialized people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities are increasingly at risk of experiencing social determinants of health. There was also a recognition there were a number of positives. Some of those who completed the program felt the judges were more kinder, more understanding and fair than in the traditional court system. They had better access to supports and connections to community resources. Those who completed the program, program did significantly better. They had better therapeutic and legal outcomes and though, than those who did not. <coughs> Excuse me. The necessity of an individualized planning was also recognized. One of the questions that was raised is, are the courts really voluntary? Some participants viewed the mental health courts as coercive because they felt that some mental health court processes resulted in another method to force people treatment. So it's really important to recognize that in the evaluation of the courts. Participants, some also felt discriminated or stereotyped when being referred to the mental health court. So it's important to be aware of the label of mental health court because BC, for instance, doesn't use that particular designation. Instead, they've called it the community court in Vancouver or the Victoria Integrated Court. There was also the data indicated that being selected to appear in mental health and specialized courts is a perceived privilege. So there appeared to be, in some cases, a selection bias that often Indigenous and racialized people with mental health and addictions issues were not being referred to the court by the Crown. And there was also a recognition that there may be a lack of access to culturally appropriate supports and treatments, which we recognize is within the entire mental health system. So a number of Indigenous and racialized people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities interviewed felt they were not able to access meaningful supports through the mental health court process because of a lack of culturally appropriate services and resources. So sometimes it may be problematic that mental health courts have no control over the quality and access of services and supports facilitated through the court process. And a number of other Barriers included a lack of resource consistency, inflexible guidelines with respect to screening and diversion, 
a lack of pre-charge diversion, and some legal professionals may use the mental health court inappropriately. Participants also felt they needed individualized planning based on their particular needs and abilities. Michael Perlin, leading mental health scholar and professor emeritus at New York Law School suggests that overall, mental health courts still do, however, increase access to justice because people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities have the opportunity through the mental health court process and the specialized court process to have a sense of voice or a chance to have their story told. And the litigant does feel a sense of validation. And when litigants emerge from a legal proceeding with that sense of voice and validation, they are more at peace with the outcome. So in this chapter, I really grappled with kind of the aspects of what various scholars, participants, and those interviewed were saying about their experiences of mental health courts and specialized courts in terms of increasing access to justice for mental for people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities. In my last few minutes, I'd just like to highlight a couple of the themes that also emerged from the chapter on women and girls with disabilities, gender discri disability discrimination that I co-authored with Dr. Laverne Jacobs. In this chapter, we highlighted multiple different intersectional barriers experienced by women and girls with disabilities. We recognize that women and girls with disabilities face violence at a comparatively disproportionate rate to people without disabilities, and they're also vulnerable to victimization as a result of the institutional structures and systemic barriers within the courts, criminal justice, and healthcare systems. And a number of these systemic barriers include a lack of access to justice, a lack of community supports, a lack of housing, a lack of health care, and societal marginalization. And there were multiple and intersecting discrimination experienced by women and girls with disabilities that is increasingly complex, particularly when issues of race, culture, ethnicity, class, age, and other social factors are involved. Our chapter also recognized the CRPD, which is the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, as the first international treaty to embrace multiple intersectional and aggravated forms of discrimination experienced by women and girls with disabilities. In particular, we highlighted a number of cases and we analyzed Article 6 of the CRPD as recognizing how women with disabilities uniquely experience gender dis disability discrimination and other forms of multiple discrimination. We also recognized how state parties must take into account the intersectional and aggravated forms of discrimination faced by women and girls with disabilities to ensure substantive equality. In closing, we put forth the argument that gender dis disability discrimination occurs when courts, tribunals, legal actors, and lawmakers neutralize the complainant's gender and fail to recognize the unique barriers that women and girls with disabilities experience. This concludes my summary of the themes highlighted within this book, and I thank everybody for engaging in the dialogue and this wonderful opportunity. I look forward to hearing your questions and thoughts, and thank you so much. It was such an honor to be part of this important dialogue. Thank you, Ruby. We will get to our question and answer part of the session. We've actually had lots of great response and pre-submitted questions. So I have two questions, which I will ask uh, Laverne first. Laverne, can you talk about issues for parents with disabilities in the context of family law and in particular child protection law? Thank you so much for the, the question, Monica, and uh, for those who submitted it. Um, yes, so there are a number of issues for parents with disabilities when it comes to family law and child protection law. Uh, with respect to child protection law, the issues are especially acute. Often children are removed from parents with disabilities in child protection hearings. Many times this removal could be avoided by providing better supports for parents with disabilities through government policy. When we discuss parenting issues and disability discrimination, it's important to note that women with disabilities in particular face significant systemic intersectional challenges with respect to parenting, 
And this picks up on uh, what Ruby was talking about, um, what we discussed to some extent in the chapter. There are a number of ways in which we see this gender disability discrimination emerge. One way that I'll highlight is that women are often blamed for not being able to maintain their families or for interacting with male partners who have caused detriment to the children in the family. One vibrant example that I discuss in the chapter on women and girls um, uh, and in the section on parenting with a disability in that chapter is uh, about a judge or it shows a judge, I should say, in a child protection case concluding that a single mother simply should have left an abusive drug partner, drug using partner. Her children are removed and the situation becomes even more complex as we peel away the additional elements relating to her intellectual disabilities and the barriers she faces in finding employment. Child protection law is one area where I think that much more attention needs to be paid to the gender disability discrimination that can exist. Uh, attention needs to be paid in the courtroom to ensure that disability appropriate approaches are taken. But collectively, I think we also need to pay attention to gender, uh, gender disability discrimination at earlier stages of parenting as a means to serving the best interests of the children. And just to give a bit more precision to this, Article 23 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities ask states parties to provide supports for parents with disabilities to assist them in child rearing responsibilities where it's in the best interest of the child. And I think that looking into government support for parents with disabilities, including in-home supports is an important aspect of this obligation. I'll finish my response to this question by saying that there are additional gender disability discrimination issues that systemically affect mothers with disabilities. A recent study in BC, for example, has shown that the dominant understanding of the selfless mother who is always there for her child is an ideal that's hard to attain by many single mothers with disabilities and even harder to um, attain by mothers with disabilities who may have, uh, have self-care responsibilities as well. Finally, how society understands the living arrangements of women who are part of larger communal families has also given rise to intersectional systemic issues. Sometimes mothers are seen to be too dependent on others when child rearing responsibilities are shared within an extended family community. Thank you. Great, okay, next question. Can you comment on the in intersection of MAID, the medical assistance in dying and disability rights including why domestic and international disability right advocates would oppose the recent Bill C-7 changes to Canada's MAID regime? Thanks so much for this question. I think it's a really important question. Uh, medical assistance in dying or MAID is an excellent example of why it's important to ensure that we view legal and political issues with the disability lens. I discussed the importance of a disability lens and the MAID issue in the first chapter of the book. What happened in the evolution of the MAID jurisprudence and law reform in a nutshell uh, is this. Um, in 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada rendered a decision called Carter that made MAID legal. A panel of experts set up by the government then created a framework for how uh, medical assistance in dying should be implemented. This included checks and balances that doctors were to comply with in administering MAID. Now, the 2015 charter case uh, of uh, the 2015 case from the Supreme Court of Canada um, had been successful under Section 7 of the charter relating to life, liberty, and security of the person. But in 2019, the door to accessing medical assistance in dying was opened even uh, more widely after a successful equality rights challenge was brought to the Quebec Superior Court. So in this later case called Truchon, the Quebec Superior Court held that the law's requirement that death be reasonably foreseeable before a person could receive medical assistance in dying violated the right to equality under the charter. The court concluded that this was because some people with disabilities would be able to access MAID while others would not. 
The Quebec decision led to changes in the criminal code to remove reasonable foreseeability of death as a precondition to obtaining MAID. However, this push for change came with massive pushback from members of the disability community. The major concern was that removing reasonable foreseeability of death promoted the understanding that the quality of life of a disabled person merited, <clears throat> excuse me, merited medical assistance in dying. In other words, it promoted an ableist assumption that disabled lives are not worth living. And I just wanna to pause to mention that disability is explicitly indicated in the law as one of the factors that make one eligible to obtain medical assistance in dying. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the time that Bill C-7 was making its way <clears throat> through Parliament, there were already reports of people with disabilities seeking medical assistance in dying because of the absence <clears throat> excuse me, of palliative care, home supports, and adequate funding to obtain necessities such as food. These people were often multiply marginalized members of the disability community. So they were um, not just people with disabilities, but also often living in poverty and often racialized as well. There were reports and accounts by people with disabilities, uh, doctors and others who worked with members of the disability community that were shared at the hearings at the House of Commons and the Senate. The matter also caught the attention of the UN Special Rapporteurs on persons with disabilities, poverty, and older persons, who drafted a statement denouncing legislation that normalizes end-of-life interventions for people with disabilities. So they stated that legislation of this nature furthers ableist assumptions about the inherent quality of life or worth of the life of a person with a disability. If substantive equality is about ensuring the dignity of individuals and making sure that disadvantage is not perpetuated, then this, is, this approach seems very much out of sync with substantive equality. A disability lens works to ensure that legal and political decisions do not perpetuate disadvantage for <clears throat> members of the disability community and do not promote a perception based on dominant uh, able-bodied views. And so I started off by saying it's important to have a disability lens and to apply it to legal and political issues. And um, this is fundamentally the reason why. So I'll just close by saying that um, we'll have to keep an eye on what happens next. Uh, Bill C-7 was accompanied by the setting up of a joint parliamentary committee that will look into what they've called, uh, and I quote this, the protection of Canadians with disabilities um, and this in the wake of MAID. So they'll be uh, submitting their report in 2022 and it'll be interesting to see what they have to say and what happens next. Thanks for the wonderful question. Thank you, Laverne. Our next two questions are for David. What strategies can police use when arresting or detaining a person with a disability? Uh, yeah, and, and thank you to Laverne for the answers to those previous questions. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, this is kind of a million dollar question. We, we do a lot of critiquing the police interaction with, with persons with disabilities in, in some of these uh, chapters. And, and it's not an easy thing to, to figure out. I mean, I think I can, you know, when you look at particularly the physical disability cases that, that we've looked at, they offer a sort of fascinating microcosm of, <clears throat> excuse me, problematic kind of state and citizen conflict in general. Right? I, I think that that much is true. The police often appear sort of ill-equipped uh, to deal with physical disability, be it mobility related or, or otherwise. And the overall picture is one of, you know, sort of being caught unawares, you know, sort of like, oh, wow, what, what do I, what do we do now? Uh, the person with the disability has presented this kind of issue or problem uh, to them. And, and you see that in, in, in some of the cases, right? You see the sort of uh, we have one case that we talk about called Hassan out of Ontario, where um, uh, the accused has a mobility disability. It's an impaired driving case. Uh, tells the tells the uh, uh, officer, and the officer is like, "We have to do a field sobriety test." Like, well, I can't do that. Like, I have a balance issue. I'm not going to be able to do it. And the officer doesn't care, right? Just sort of, you know, obviously they fail uh, this field sobriety test uh, in large part because of their disability. And you know, those are those are definitely uh, problematic. That kind of interaction, and certainly on the mental health side, uh, we see we see that as well. So, I mean, to to summarize, I think training 
training is, is key. Like I've had uh, police officers on the stand and I've asked them, you know, what, what training do you receive in terms of uh, interacting with persons with disabilities? And they'll look at you even worse than they normally look at you as a defense lawyer. You know, they, they, they look at you like, like you're, it's a crazy question. Like, well, none, like, well, what do you mean? You know, uh, and, and that's it. So I think training is a, a really important part. Active listening and awareness. I think some of the cases disclose that there really isn't uh, a lot of active listening or awareness of disability as a, as a concept. Right? I think people are a lot of police interaction uh, doesn't deal with that. Better communication generally, I, I think, in terms of uh, working with disability uh, advocacy groups and, and those kind of things, I think would be very important for, for policing. So developing those strategies and not seeing it as a, a, a problem that has to be fixed in the moment, but really thinking about those interactions ahead of time, uh, I think is very important. So, so that's, a, and I'll try and be brief, but that, that's a sort of summary of some of the things I, I would say are, are, are positive strategies. Great. Okay, next question. What are the benefits and detriments of preventative and first response policing when police encounter persons with disabilities? Yeah, and again, this is a question you spend two hours answering, I think, in terms of, you know, uh, policing in, in general. Um, you know, whether we look at sort of preventive policing as being sort of, you know, community-based outreach and patrol, and that has its own uh, myriad sort of issues. I mean, crime is where you find it, right? So, you know, where you're looking. So I, I think there, there's lots of issues that come along with that for all marginalized populations, not just persons with disabilities. Um, uh, first response uh, kind of model, and they're obviously not mutually exclusive, but that response model has come into a, a great deal uh, of criticism uh, recently with the defund police movement in North America and elsewhere uh, coming out of Black Lives Matter and various other social movements. And I think, you know, you can certainly see in the, the cases that we that we interrogate in, in this work, you can certainly see why that is. I mean, you know, we've, we've looked at a number of inquest cases of fatal uh uh, shootings uh, where, where people with mental health disabilities interact with the police and it's, it, it has to stop. Like it, it, there, there's no question that, you know, we have um, a lack of, of, of training, not, not, not defense training, like, I mean, not in terms of uh, the, the shooting, but in terms of how to, how to deescalate uh, situations when, when dealing with people with mental health uh, uh, disabilities. I think that that's uh, very, very much part of the, um, uh, uh, picture there. So, so again, I'm, I'm not sure I can, I can answer the, the, the question fully other than to say that, you know, we need to really seriously consider uh, how we're deploying police uh, at these points of interaction when there is a state citizen interaction, particularly with mental health disability. Uh, it should never end in, in the loss of life. And I think, you know, that's, that's something we're seeing all too regularly. So, so again, not, not to sort of you know, not answer the question, but, but I think, I think the, those things are, are continually, we need, we need to, to interrogate them and, and put pressure on the authorities to make sure that the people are properly trained and funding goes in the right direction, not just to enforcement. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be my response to that. Great. Thank you, David. We actually have time for one more question. So this one will be for Ruby. What recommendations can you give to improve access to justice for mental health courts? Thanks so much, Monica. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I'm just going to give a couple examples of, of what really came out of some of the empirical work that I've done. So uh, a lot of the stakeholders interviewed said that the court approaches should try to be uh, consistent uh, with the charter and, you know, also with the CRPD. So mental health courts should recognize the positive right for participants to live freely and at risk without coercion. So this is really getting at that aspect of ensuring that mental health courts are really voluntary and that if the client uh, doesn't want to participate, they don't feel kind of coerced into it. Um, and they should be fully informed of the court processes and mandate before voluntarily consenting to participate. Ensuring that the courts recognize and address issues of social determinants of health, such as homelessness, community supports, poverty reduction and employment, uh, systemic discrimination and systemic racism. So in one aspect of that, also ensuring the ensuring that the courts have 
uh, access to culturally appropriate care and support, in particular for Indigenous communities and, and BIPOC communities. And there should be also uh, rotating judges, Crown and lawyers involved in the courts, kind of adopting anti-racism, anti-colonial approaches. And another recommendation that came forward was that uh, referrals should be made, uh, should be able to be made to the mental health courts and specialized courts by all stakeholders. And it shouldn't only be limited to Crown making the referral. So for instance, peer led organizations uh, should be able to refer to the court uh, if they, think that a client would benefit from the process. And also lastly, that there should be more research monitoring and evaluation using kind of a critical and rigorous methodology led by people with mental health and addictions issues and disabilities, and that race-based stats should be collected. Thank you so much for that fantastic question, Monica, and thank you for organizing this. Thank you, Ruby. So I'm just going to say a few closing words. Just to remind everyone, the webinar recording and any unanswered questions will be sent out in a follow-up email after today's session within the next week to week and a half. I would like to thank Ruby, David, and Laverne for taking time to speak to us today, as well as everybody who attended today's session. For anyone interested in purchasing a copy of their book, Law and Disability in Canada, it's available on the LexisNexis eStore at LexisNexis.ca. Thank you everybody for attending and I hope you have a great day.